Hey mushroom fans, it's Anna McHugh. Uh, I'm out looking around at mushrooms and it's a beautiful day and I have happened across a pretty nice collection of Clytosabe nuda. This is a fairly popular edible mushroom uh, commonly called the bluet. And uh, so these mushrooms are fairly recognizable. They're a little bit, uh, you know, dull and tan from the top typically. But as you look at the bottoms of them, they have these really attractive sort of light purpley gills. As the mushroom matures, those gills sort of turn uh, even lighter and sort of a pinky color as the mushroom spores, which are sort of a pinky whitish color, also mature and drop. So I'm gonna give you identification features for the Bluet Clytosabe nuda. Additionally, I'm going to introduce two of the look-alike mushrooms. Uh, neither of them are dangerous, but one of them, Cortinarius iodes, is something that you wanna be aware of because Cortinarius is a genus that generally is uh, avoided from a culinary perspective because there's some dangerous ones. So I'm gonna talk about Cortinarius. I'm gonna talk about also uh, Lactarius indigo group, which is another blue purpley mushroom that I absolutely adore. But before I get into that and the ID features for Clytosabe nuda in particular, I want to talk about their lifestyle. So, um, you know, this is tips for finding them uh, and also uh, potentially transplanting them. So Clytosabe nuda is a decomposer, specifically a secondary decomposer. So you have mushrooms that grow on wood and they're pretty conspicuously like decomposing the wood that they live on. But then you have a lot of mushrooms that grow on the forest floor and many of them are mycorrhizal, meaning that they grow in association with a tree or a plant partner. So once you find them, you'll find them in the same spot year after year underneath their partner tree or plant. In the case of decomposers uh, that are secondary decomposers, they tend to eat, you know, leaf litter and uh, compost that is way further along in its process, uh, you know, from wood to, uh, to soil. And so you'll find them growing on the ground, but they're not growing in association with things. And uh, so it's an interesting area to focus on when you're trying to get a bead on exactly how a mushroom is growing and what its lifestyle is because that's helpful for identification. So I have two uh, secondary decomposers on my hands here. Of course, there's Claytosa binuda, but also this beautiful macro lepiata species I wanted to show you. This is a cap and stem mushroom that has these gorgeous scales on the top, um, and it's uh, really sort of tall and elegant. It has some stretch marks uh, along this very, uh, you know, nice stipe. It's, it's hollow on the inside, and a beautiful little ring that is, uh, you know, two-tone, and just uh, again this is uh, one of those mushrooms that you could you can close your eyes and easily picture it so it's a secondary decomposer and so uh, trouble with it is you'll sometimes find it a couple of years in the same place but as it consumes you know the leaf litter that it's in you may not find it as predictably as you may with uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms so uh, you know nonetheless this is a really good example of a mushroom you'd find on the forest floor that is uh, you know when you pick it up oftentimes you'll find a big old like um, you know attachment of uh, mycelium that's sort of permeated with fairly advanced uh, decomposed leaves so you'll often see that in the case of you know macro lepiata and uh, uh, the parasol mushrooms but also with your uh, Clytosabe nuda so I'm going to show you this um, you know the uh, mushroom itself is a classic sort of cap and stem dealy uh, they have this sort of nice purpley color but again, on the, on the top, they can be a little bit on the tan side. You also see uh, as the mushroom is, is not very determinate, like it's not very uh, sort of um, uh, symmetrical and round, like you'll have little bumps and waves. Oftentimes in these little crevices and creases, it'll take on more tan fawn colors. And then around the rim of the fresh ones, you oftentimes see this uh, nice purpley rim. So that's a thing that you only see on blue. It's, uh, you know, by way of comparison with their their lookalikes. So this is a mature specimen and they they oftentimes get this little sort of funky flowery thing going on. They also also oftentimes have little 
little bit of streakiness on the stem. And so a slight furriness, but it's a, uh, you know, um, whitish in color, uh, but a little bit darker in the background. When they are younger, they're even more distinct distinctively, uh, you know, streaky on the stem, more distinctively purpley on the gills. So, you know, oftentimes mushrooms, they start out with light gills and then uh, the spores are colored more darkly and the mushrooms gills will turn dark. In the case of Clytosa binuta, it's kind of interesting because they start a little bit darker, but because the, the uh, spores are sort of this uh, whitish pink color, they actually um, sort of turn uh, lighter as opposed to darker as they mature. So anyway, uh, you know, you have this purpley color and oftentimes kind of a, a, not a boot per se, but just like an abrupt, uh, you know, place where the, the mushroom is popped up. So, you know, it's a, a little foot oftentimes. And in the case of Clytosa binuta, you, again, when you uh, pick them, you'll oftentimes get a big uh, sort of collection of uh, leaf litter on the bottom of that. And the interesting thing is that Clytosa binuta and its mycelium is very, very robust. And so this is one of the very few mushrooms that I can confidently say I have trimmed stem butts and thrown them in my backyard and then subsequently saw bluets. And so I'm not saying I did it. I'm pretty confident that they are a related uh, phenomenon. I also have other friends who have more demonstrably been able to say, okay, I took this and I put it in a, you know, a jar and I was able to cultivate the mycelium and place it into, uh, especially leaf litter is what it likes, deciduous uh, leaf litter. So anyway, this is an edible mushroom. It is not, in my opinion, super remarkable, but I do eat them because they are, uh, well, they're blue purple and I like blue purple mushrooms. So if you're uh, in the anti-bluet camp, then that, uh, that suits me just fine, but leave me alone. So let's talk about lookalikes. Uh, there are a couple of them that are, um, you know, well, I have two of them right here. There's a third uh, that is an edible mushroom called uh, Laceria ochropoporia that is also sort of a purpley mushroom. But uh, I did another video about that and it's kind of a ludicrous, like um, cartoony purple uh, on its gills as opposed to this nice uh, sort of tightly packed uh, blade-like purple gills. But what I have here is Cortinarius iodi, uh, Iodes. Uh, this is a mushroom that is, uh, you know, kind of purpley in its appearance, especially when it's younger and a little bit more on the wet side. So the common name for this would be the uh, purple viscid quart. Um, excuse me, I'm going to have some water. We're going to take a pause. Intermission music. Mmm. Oh, while we're at it, actually, what I want to do is take one of these Cortinarius Iodes and uh, see if I can show you one of its most distinctive features, which is Cortinarius uh, iodes is very uh, sticky and slimy on top. So that other one I was just handling is uh, was a little bit on the, the dried out side, but you know, unlike Clytosa binuta, which is like at best uh, a little bit tacky, but is definitely smooth, uh, Cortinarius iodes or the viscid purple quart is really slimy on top. Um, and you know, it again, it's hard to tell uh, how purple this actually is just in the camera, but it has very similar purple tones to our, um, you know, our uh, Clytosa binuta, our bluet. However, uh, Cortinarius can be distinguished pretty easily uh, on the basis of a couple of things. So first of all, uh, it has brownish gills. As the mushroom matures, that will actually turn even more sort of rusty colored uh, because that's the color of the spores. So right off the bat, you have a pretty distinctive difference between this uh, tightly, you know, packed blade-like purpley stuff and, uh, you know, a more brown sort of rusty color. Additionally, uh, you have this, you know, sticky cap. This one doesn't have the feature as uh, well as I would like. It. Oh, here we go. Okay, so one of the other very important distinguishing features for Cortinarius, and this is a little bit faint, is what's called a cortina. So essentially, it's just a cobwebby layer of tissue that is on the mushroom's gills and the perimeter of the cap when the mushroom is a baby. And when it pops, you'll oftentimes find, uh, you know, at, at this is pretty faint, a ring on the stem 
um, that is the remains of that. And it is usually the same color as these, uh, you know, brownish gills. So a little bit uh, brown, rusty. And oftentimes you'll actually see little strings of it. It's very, uh, you know, elaborate and neat and uh, Halloween-y looking because it, it looks very much like uh, um, uh, the fake spider webs that they use. So uh, Cortinarius iotes, another thing to note about it is that it has uh, purple uh, coloration toward the base of the stem. Sometimes this is a way, way more purple mushroom. Um, and I'm going to give it the name Cortinarius iotes on the basis of the fact that there's, uh, yeah, there's two sort of purple viscid quartz that I am aware of. Cortinarius iotes, and let me see if I can do this. Cortinarius Iodioides. Cortinarius Iodioides. So basically it's a D-E-O-I-D-E-S. Uh, at any rate, it is another mushroom that has this sort of, uh, you know, violet color, uh, but it is also viscid on the top. And the difference between the two is the flavor of the snot on the cap. So I'm going to um, endeavor to uh, ascertain my, uh, my identification here, because if it's Cortinarius iodes, the snot is not going to taste like anything. If it's Cortinarius iodeides, it should taste a little bit sour or bitter. So I am going to proceed to lick this mushroom. Yeah, got nothing. So this I'm going to call Cortinarius iodes, and uh, on on the basis of the fact that it does have snot, but it is not, um, you know, a sour snot. So uh, that's a mushroom you don't want to eat, uh, but you know can be uh, very similar in appearance to uh, Clytosa nuda, So you want to be aware of it. The second one I'm going to show you is is really not a look-alike, but I'm going to call it a look-alike because I'm super pumped that I found it. Uh, this is Lactarius indigo group. It is a blue mushroom that has, uh, you know, a really distinctive divot in the middle with these beautiful concentric growth zones. You have these little, uh, like, potholes at the base. I was just looking at them with my hand lens, and they're just really cool looking on the inside. And then, uh, additionally, the thing that makes this really fun and lactarious in general as a genus is characterized by uh, bleeding uh, a latex or some sort of juice. But in the case of lactarious indigo group, it is super blue. It's pretty abundant. So it's just like a messy fun mushroom. So obviously if you were to find these two in the field, they don't look a lot alike. I guess the only instance I think I could see that is if you have, you're sort of looking at them from the top uh, and you know, this is, when these mushrooms are older, sometimes they're a little bit less brilliantly blue and a little more on the, uh, you know, tan out color. Uh, but this is an edible mushroom, so it wouldn't be a, you know, problematic distinction. I think your main issue would be in uh, preparation because these mushrooms do need to be cooked a little bit differently. This is more brittle. This is more uh, almost like rubbery. So uh, I treat them differently when I'm working with them in the kitchen. So the long and the short is uh, I'm really a big fan of finding um, these decomposers that are growing on the ground and growing in leaf litter because I love to be able to see how long I can uh, come back and observe them year by year, season by season. And, um, you know, additionally, sometimes I whisk them away with me and see if I can end up with some of those mushrooms in my own backyard. Again, I am not fully convinced that I was able to bring my uh, Clytosa nuda mycelium home a couple of years ago and make some grow, but uh, I think there's a good enough chance that I don't feel ashamed that I told you that story.